Hello everyone. We welcome you for tonight's talk, New Discoveries Along the Suanchang Trail, Where the Buddha Cut His Hair, by Deepak Anand. This is a very interesting topic for those who go for Buddhist pilgrimage. If I ask you, have you ever been to this place where the Buddha cut his hair? And I'm sure that the answer will be no. No, why? Because this place is lost to the forest and it's lost in history, if not for the discovery by our special speaker tonight. Now, his guide and reference has been from the seventh century records of Venerable Xuanzang, who traveled on food uh, from China to India. So Deepak uh, retraced Xuanzang's trail in Northern India and reveal to us this site which he has just discovered. Now, we, when we go for Buddhist pilgrimage, I myself lead Buddhist pilgrimage, and uh, very often a Buddhist pilgrimage involves four major pilgrimage sites, and this was mentioned by the Buddha in the, the, um, uh, in this, in the sermon, uh, Parinibbana Sutta, uh, where he says that we should visit his birthplace, which is Lumbini, place of enlightenment, Budgaya, preaching at the first sermon, Saranath, and passing away at Kushinara. And if you want to be a bit more adventurous, and uh, you can actually include four other places of miracles. This is Srabasti, uh, the place for the twin miracle, Rajgir, where the Buddha subdued the elephant called Nalagiri, Sankasya, the place where the Buddha descended from heaven after teaching his mother uh, in the Tabatimsa heaven, Abhidhamma, yeah? And Veshali, where honey was offered from a monkey. Now these places were discovered uh, by the archeological works of the British archeologists in the 19th century. So this was like 1800s, 18 something. And they also went by the records of Sun Zhang and uh, Fa Xian. This was the two Chinese pilgrims who have written some accounts of, of what they found in India. But uh, are these the only places uh, worthy of Buddhist pilgrimage? How about the other places associated with the Buddha, but has been lost through time? Because Buddhism disappeared from India about um, 800 years ago. But even before that, some of these places disappeared when Buddhism was no longer practiced in those areas. But how did we know where they are? So really, the, uh, Buddha, uh, the British archaeologists uh, have identified some sites, and those are the sites that we are visiting. But over a century, nobody tried to find new places for us to discover, places for pilgrimage. Right? So tonight, we're going to talk about, our speaker is going to talk about the place where the Buddha shaved his head as a symbol of renunciation from a princely life to adopt the life of a wandering Sramana. And that actually, he set out on his spiritual journey. And we know that six years later, he became the fully enlightened Buddha. We are very fortunate that for Buddhist pilgrimage, we have two historical figures who have left some signposts for us to discover these holy places. I think the first one, our tribute and our thanks to Emperor Ashoka, who lived about 250 years after the Buddha. He identified these sites. After he became Buddhist, he identified the sites and he built a stupa and sometimes uh, erect a pillar. So by these, you can actually identify the places. Now, the second uh, person is, comes by the name of uh, Venerable Xuan Zhang. Okay, this is Venerable Xuan Zhang, 602 to 664, uh, Common Era. He had a remarkable record, having traveled Assyria from China to India and visited all the places associated with the Buddha which he recorded in the great town record of the Western region. Now, Xuanzang was really determined and fearless because he traveled from China to India in order to study under the great masters at Nalanda. His other mission was also to collect the scriptures and the Buddha relics and statues in order to bring them back to China. His journey was really truly epic in every sense because he faced with danger and difficulty and he traveled almost alone in the vast, dry Gobi Desert that has extreme uh, temperature. 
that became a death trap for travelers. And there was also an imperial addict uh, to kill him, to catch him, to, uh, to catch him, uh, to capture him, and to shoot also, uh, because he had defied, uh, he has not obtained the permission from the emperor to travel out of the country. He was at the door of death many times. Uh, his first encounter was when the water bottle fell from his hands in the desert and he spent about the next four or five days wandering around and he almost died. He fell on the sand and cried out to Kuan Yin. He was no longer afraid for himself, really. He's not afraid to die, but he asked Kuan Yin to help because he says, Kuan Yin, please help me. I would like to go to India to, uh, to collect uh, scriptures to bring back to China. Uh, please help me. And after that, He's no longer afraid of death, and he faced death a couple of times. Uh, there was an avalanche that hit his, uh, uh, you know, while he was cruising, crossing some snowy mountain peaks. He was being captured by robbers who was about to kill he together with his group, and he was almost burned on stake as a human sacrifice. It took three years for Sun Chang to reach India, and for the most part, he made this journey alone. It was a miracle that he survived in the deserts in the mountains of ice and snow, in the desolate plains, in the heat and sandstorm. So when he got to India alive and in one piece, that indeed was a great miracle. His journey took 17 years before he returned back to China. But the wonderful thing about Dharma Suen Chang is that he will travel to every place of Buddhist interest and make detailed notes about them, all right? So when he traveled in India, he found, tried to find the places associated with the Buddha recorded them in terms of directions with such great precision that we can almost identify. It is almost like Sun Chang, 600 AD, I would almost came to know that when Buddhism has disappeared in India, would he be able to give enough directions so that people are able to discover these places, which is lost through time, all right? So um, uh, let me just give you the context. Tonight's talk was where the Buddha shaved his head um, you know, after the Bodhisattva, the Buddha-to-be, uh, saw the four sites, he was actually seriously thinking about renunciation. On the day of the renunciation, he spent the whole day in the park, lost in his thoughts. And about sunset, King Sododana, his father, heard that Princess Yashodara has just given birth to the son. Of course, the king rejoiced and said, you have to bring this news to the prince you know, maybe the prince might give up his idea of renouncing because the king also knows that the prince is thinking about renouncing. But when he heard, when the prince heard this news, he said, oh no, an eclipse has arisen, an eclipse in Rahula. And he says a fatter is created. So it is something that was going to tie him down. So the prince knew that that is the night that he would have to renounce. He returned to the palace in splendor and he laid on his royal couch and the beautiful uh, dancers and musicians came to entertain him. But he was lost in thoughts. And at that time, he was not interested in the performance at all. He fell uh, asleep on the couch. So when the, when the musicians and the dancers saw that he was asleep, they stopped performing and they were also tired and they slept, you know. And when the prince woke up, he saw that they were sleeping in different positions. There was saliva dripping from the chin. The hair was disheveled. And when he look at the oh, he looks at the, the performers, they actually look like corpses in a cemetery. And the palace that he was living with was like a house on fire, and he has to get out. So he went to the stable and woke up Chana, who was his charioteer, and he told Chana that this will be the night of the great renunciation. And says, Chana, go and harness Kantaka, his favorite horse. Now the prince, before leaving, went to the bedroom in order to have a glimpse of Yashodara and also the newly born son. And Yashodara, having given birth to the baby, was, was really happy like a mother, you know, just having given birth to the son. But her arms was being uh, covered over the face of Rahula. And the prince, the Buddha-to-be, could not see the face of the son. But he dare not lift the hands of Yashodara for fear that it might awaken her. And he says to himself that he will see the sun again after attaining enlightenment. Then he walked across the courtyard. The whole palace was very quiet. 
and he saw that China was waiting with Kantaka. It was a beautiful horse with great strength and speed. And he mounted on this horse together with Kantaka. The two of them actually mounted on the same horse and they rode out of the Eastern Gate of Kapilabastu. The prince was 29 years old. He was in the peak of youth. And he, when he took the last look at the city, he says, I will not enter the city again before I have crossed over and gained the power over old age of death. And he wrote forth in great renunciation, giving up worldly power that was in his grasp to find a way uh, out of universal suffering. Now the sources tell us that the Buddha to be wrote past three kingdoms. So he's already out of the territory of the, of the Sakyans. And, uh, and then they came to the river Anoma. Anoma means not shallow. So it was deep, deep water. And um, the horse leapt over the river water. And then the prince and the Chana came down to the sandy bank. Then the prince got down and said, Chana, my friend, these are the ornaments. You take the ornaments and Kantaka, return back to the kingdom. I want to become a monk. And Chana looked at the prince with, with such great shock and the tears were flowing down his face. He says, no, I too want to be a monk. But the Buddha to be says, no, Chana, this is not the time. You are not destined to be a monk. Go, take my ornaments and a horse. And the king had, the, the prince had long hair. And he thinks it's not proper for a monk to have long hair. So the future Buddha took the sword in his right hand and cut his hair. And they reflected that the clothes that he's wearing are the very fine silk, you know, from, from uh, you know, that, that uh, a princely girl. And then he exchanged his robes, his, his uh, clothes for the robes of a monk. And he says to Chana, 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 go back, inform my parents I'm in good health. So, of course, this was a very sad moment for Chana and the horse as they parted ways. And the horse, Kantaka, could not believe what is happening. There are actually two accounts. In one account, Kantaka was so heartbroken that he actually fell and died. And uh, from a Tibetan record, the charioteer and the horse returned back to Kapalabasu, but it took them seven days. So Kantaka didn't even want to run. And after that, upon reaching Kapilavastu, Kantaka died and a mound was built over his body. So that was the context of this talk. Now, let me introduce to you the, our special speaker tonight. His name is Deepak Anand. He's a Buddhist pilgrimage explorer and uh, passionate about uh, writing about the revival of the ancient Buddhist pilgrimage in India. He received his bachelor's of engineering at the Shanti Lal Shah College of Engineering in Gujarat and as his MBA at the Punjab University. And he's published a few books and articles. Uh, some of the books are Xuanzang's about Xuanzang. Xuanzang, Footsteps That Time Cannot Erase and the Pilgrimage Legacy of Xuanzang. So he really had done a lot of study of Xuanzang and very passionate about Xuanzang. And he has actually traveled on foot 750 kilometers. I think by now it's more than this now. He has gone on foot at a grassroots level, visiting villages and being enriched by Sun Chang's uh, eyewitness account of the sites that are connected with, with the Buddha. And along the way, he received food and shelter from the people. This is really the custom of India. And then we know that how a Tramana in India could survive without, without having food. They just travel and household will just give them food and, and some kind of shelter. This is the tradition of India, okay? So tonight's uh, talk will be about something special. This place where the Buddha shaved his hair is completely lost. And the record that we had was from Xuanzang in the 600 uh, 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 CE. And uh, our speaker will tell you about his account on how he discovered this place. All right, let me just uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Deepak uh, to, uh, to give his talk. Deepak. Hello, uh, Dr. Lee. Thanks a lot. Good evening to all of you, all the viewers. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity, Dr. V. Yeah. So on the on the left side of uh, on the screen, you can see this is a mound. This is mound which I think is the uh, this is the mound which I've identified on the basis of Xuanzang, the place where Buddha cut his hair. 
so the idea is the thought is why why do i think i mean why why i think that this is the mount this is the place where buddha cut is here based on basically it's based on shenzang uh, records that i have uh, reached this place so let me share with you the whole story of how the discoveries were made in like you know in the gangetic plain about all this uh, buddhist places of pilgrimage so starting from like you know uh, this is sankasa so sankasa was discovered by kaningam in 1842 so uh, this was i mean at that time the geography was not properly known and all the places mentioned by fashian and shenzang in their travel accounts like all the places their names were changed but uh, this place sankasa so sankasa was the only place which uh, continued with the same name i mean the uh, the place was the name changed but i mean it remained the same i mean this this was the place where the name, uh, name remained same so kaningam when he went there in 1842 he found this ashokan uh, capital elephant uh, capital there so on the basis of that he could uh, identify that uh, this is the place uh, where uh, buddha descended from heaven sankasa but uh, from sankasa uh, shenzang went to many places like you know he went to kosam ayodhya and vishoka uh, vishakha where vishoka and then from there he went to shravasti so it took like you know 21 years to identify shravasti based on shenzang and fashian uh, travel accounts basically because the geography was not properly understood at that time they, they they didn't had proper maps and names of all the places were changed like shravasti of ancient time it became sahit and mahit so this british explorer especially cunningham he faced lots of difficulty in identifying this place so the why i'm putting up all this thing is because it was very difficult to this uh, explorers at that time they faced lots of difficulty in identifying the places so once the shravasti was identified in 1863 this whole area was dense forest i mean uh, at the time of uh, british uh, explorers when they were exploring it was dense forest it was like you know everything was wild so Uh, this was this is how you know cunningham identified shravasti when he was doing some digging some excavation so he discovered this uh, image of bodhisattva uh, buddha and this image on this image there was an inscription saying uh, shravasti so on the basis of this uh, image shravasti was identified in 1863 so from shravasti uh, shenzang and fashian both of them they went to kapilavastu and uh, uh, lumbini and the places of other two buddha karakachunda buddha and kanak buddha kanak muni buddha and from lumbini both of these pilgrims they went to rama grama so kaningam uh, uh, based on his exploration he did some guess work and he descended little south and he made some identification of uh, kapilavastu rama grama you can see all these places i mean these are the added, this uh, orange line this is the line which is which was followed by kaningam in identifying the places mentioned by shenzang so like you no know, uh this is uh, uh this is nagar he identified as kapilavastu uh, similarly i mean uh, karakchandu buddha and all these places this uh, this line this line is basically the path taken by kaningam in making identification based on shenzang and fashion accounts so after 10 15 years after him his assistant kalail he took the similar path and he like you know re examined the kaningam's identification and he proposed new identification so this green line is the identification made by carline so again uh, this was in 1877 so in 1890s three ashokan pillars were discovered here in 1890s ashokan pillars were discovered here like you know one was at gothiawa one was at uh, nigliawa and another was at uh, rumandi that is lumbini so this ashokan pillar shenzang mentions about this ashokan pillars which was uh, which marked the places of karakchunda buddha kanakmuni buddha and the uh, birthplace of gautama buddha so now all this identification which were made by kaningam they proved to be wrong so uh, kaningam made identification of rama grama and the hair cutting stupa where buddha cut his hair and where he exchanged robes and the place where he sent back chandaka so all those places which kaningam and kalal identified at this place they were wrong so now these are the ashokan pillars which were discovered by uh, in 1890s by uh, british explorers and uh, some nepalese explorers and uh, indian explorers also so based on this exploration these three uh, ashokan pillars were identified so all the previous uh, identifications done by alexander kaningam and kalal was wrong so now to look for rama grama and other places like you know places where place where from rama grama shenzang went to the place where buddha sent back chandaka 
and uh, after that he cut his hair so all those places were now not here but somewhere here this side so based on this identification uh, now this is the, this is the map like you know from shravasti this this was the identification proposed by cunningham and carly so this were wrong so now this the new identification which were made in 1890s based on ashokan pillar so rama grama chandaka stupa and hair cutting stupa they were to be uh, for, to be discovered in this this direction so based on uh, the new identification william hoy proposed rama grama this is in nepal so this was identified on the basis of the new identification made by um, uh, in 1890s the ashokan pillar the ashokan pillars which were discovered so from here from rama grama Uh, Shenzhen and Fashian, both of them, Shenzhen uh, travel hundred li, and Fashian travel four yuan. So it comes at approximately twenty to thirty kilometers, or I mean up to thirty-five kilometers. So both of them they traveled in the east direction, and uh, so I mean this is the travel of Shenzhen and Fashian from Tilarakot, that is uh, Kapilavastu city. From here, uh, they went to Lumbini, and uh, so this is the travel. I mean this is the uh, route of uh, Shenzhen and Fashian. This is the trail, the, the track which both of them they took. So. from rama grama both of them they went to uh, this place uh, where Ch chandaka where bodhisattva siddhartha sent back the chandaka and then after that he, uh, the whole story just after we shared with us so now the point is i was looking for this places somewhere on the east of this side so the other literature also mentions about i mean there are many biographical text of uh, buddha and all this text they mention about uh, this great renunciation in very detail so uh, they share the same story in different details like you know abhishkramana sutra they, it mentions that buddha crossed uh, bodhisattva siddhartha on that night of uh, ashala punima he crossed rama grama so from kapilavastu traveling uh, it's like 65 kilometers so he crossed rama grama so next uh, pali sources burmese account and lalit vistra says uh, siddhartha reached on the uh, at the bank of anoma so uh, basically in uh, i mean it is being believed that uh, narayani river gandak river Gand narayani is the name of gandak river in uh, nepal so it is believed that uh, gandak is uh, the present day gandak is anoma of ancient times pali sources and uh, nidana katha says that uh, river was very wide i mean it was a wide river where i mean buddha with chandaka it leaped and burmese sources say that kanthaka the horse uh, once it leaped uh, so i mean it landed on a i mean like sand bank i mean it was sand uh, it was a uh, sand bank so and then lalit vistra and abhishkramana sutra says that there was in a memorial stupa uh, erected at that place even shenzhen and fashian says that where uh, buddha uh, bodhisattva siddhartha said goodbye to uh, chandaka uh, chandaka and uh, kanthaka so there was a stupa built there by ashoka so all these things like you know reaches us to this Uh, gandak river and uh, on this bank uh, so this is river gandak and it's like you know very wide and it's uh, i mean forest everywhere and uh, so my guess was that uh, it should be somewhere here like you know this gandak river this is the place where gandak river comes to plains from the uh, hills so this gandak river is very wide here like this area is very wide this is the modern embankment which was created some 40 50 years ago so otherwise this was like you know this river was from here it was like you know this is the there were many uh, like you know this river has taken many courses in last few centuries so my guess was that i should find this uh, stupa somewhere in this area so this is bihar this is nepal this is uttar pradesh so uh, both of them uh, shenzhen and fashian says that uh, there was an ashokan stupa to mark the place where uh, and buddha sent uh, chandaka and then after sending chandaka uh, shenzhen says that on the east of uh, uh, this stupa there is the place where uh, bodhisattva siddhartha cut his hair and then uh, he exchanged uh, clothes with a hunter so i could not explore here i could not locate this chandaka written stupa because i was not allowed to go to this area because because of covid and uh, there were some tensions in india nepal border so i was not allowed to explore here but my guess is that it should be somewhere here so next was to look for these two stupas which was east of this place after sending off uh, both this uh, horse and uh, his uh, charioteer 
Bodhisattva Siddhartha moved in the, his direction. So I was hoping to find this two stupas. One of them was Ashokan stupa, according to Shwenza. So I was hoping to find uh, this stupa somewhere in this area, you know. So when, when I reached there, I was uh, very, uh, I mean, like, you know, uh, I was a little disheartened because it was all forest and whomsoever I met, I mean, they were like, you know, all the population because, you know, until 50 years ago, it was all forest. So when this uh, barrage was created, this uh, little dam was created here, so people started settling here. So all the settlements are very recent. There are only two villages like Dar uh, this uh, Daruwabari and Thari, which is like, you know, people from, uh, th these are the tribal people who are, who are settled here for last, I mean, centuries. So these were the only people who were ancient. Otherwise, all these people are, I mean, they are uh, very recent settlers. So after meeting few people, I met uh, one gentleman and he told me, I, when I shared with him, I'm looking for two mounds closely placed and uh, it should be like, you know, total uh, big structure. And uh, so where should I look for it? So he said that there are two mounds, as I said, I mean, very closely placed. And these are the only two mounds in this whole area. And, uh, and still they are worshipped by this, this people. They are Tharu people. They are tribal people, Tharu people. So they still worship this. I mean, they are, these are still very uh, place of worship. So based on this inputs, I went to this place. So this is like, you know, this is the village Daruabari. And this is the first mound is Bhavan Gadi, Bhavan Gadi, and under this is Sagar Mai. So there was, according to the people whom I met here, they told me that this, this two places were connected by some, you know, uh, ancient route. There was, there was a connection between these two mounds. So it was recently broken. He said, when this road was being made, this road that you see, this, this white uh, mark uh, line, so when this road was being made, this road which was connecting these two, it got destroyed. So otherwise, these two, and they said that this is very, like, you know, pious place still among the tribal people who live in this district, in this whole area. So people from neighboring 30, 40 kilometers of radius, they come and they uh, make sacrificial, sacrificial uh, offering here at this place. So this is the first mound. So Shrenzang says uh, a small stupa, he saw a small stupa to mark the place where uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha exchange uh, dress with uh, this hunter. So uh, this is a mound and still it is like, you know, six to seven feet above the neighboring fields and it is circular and uh, it is, this diameter is hundred feet. And uh, there's a modern temple. It was created 25 years ago. It's a modern temple. And uh, I mean, they had dug somewhere. So I just took this picture. It's a cross section. It shows it's full of brick, ancient bricks. And this is a big size there. These are the bricks. This was, uh, I mean, it's on the surface. These bricks are, I mean, on the surface. And when I contacted my friend, uh, an uh, archaeologist in uh, ASI, uh, Sri, uh, Dr. Sujit Nayan, so he told me, I shared with him the size of the bricks. And he said, these bricks belong to Shung or Kushan period. I mean, like, you know, it's like very ancient. It's from 1st century, 1st century BC to 2nd century AD. So it's on the surface. So if you lit, do little digging, if you go five, six feet uh, further below, so may, you may find something like, you know, even more ancient. So this is the first site. So according to Swenzang, this was a small stupa, but still, I, I, I just as I shared with you that this is still like you know more than six to seven feet from the neighboring fields, and it's totally circular. If you see from a distance, you can make it out like you know it's a stupa structure, and it's totally brick structure. And this is another mound. So you can see from a distance, it's all it's in the uh, like you know in the middle of the forest. And this whole area is, a, is like, you know, part of the Tiger Reserve, Valmiki Tiger Reserve. And uh, so I, I could not make a good picture because it's all camouflaged. It's all like, you know, trees everywhere, grass everywhere. So you can see this is like, you know, and this mound is spread in two acres. This is very huge mound. It's spread in two acres. And this is a little close up. And you can see this is a shrine here on the top. This is a shrine on the top. This is shrine, modern this is shrine. But this stupa is very huge. And, and again, it's a total brick structure. I mean, bricks are on the surface. So this is the guy, local Tharu person who helped me in uh, like, you know, uh, taking me, he took me to this place. And he shared with me that this place is still very highly revered among the like, you know, local uh, Tharu people. So, and this is again the brick, bricks here. So this brick size, I mean, again, the same bricks of the first mound, the Bhavan Gadi mound. And uh, so these bricks are again from same uh, Shung and Kushan period. And they are on the surface. So if you do some digging, and this is very, I mean, like, and it's still, it's uh, more than 20 to 30 feet from the neighboring uh, fields still. So uh, according to Shwenzang, it was an Ashokan stupa. So it was a big stupa. As I mentioned, it was, it is spread in more than two acres of land. 
and uh, it's a uh, very huge and ancient bricks and on the top of it this is this shrine is there you know i was just asked, this is elephant shrine and i'm sharing this picture of uh, samai mai shrine in tilar kota that the, i mean while i was walking so as i was walking in this tarai area i noticed this uh, elephant shrine uh, this uh, samai mai shrine everywhere after crossing uh, like you know uh, from in the in, in the ancient kapil vastu empire i think it was very prominent I mean, in this area it was uh, it is very prominent shrine wherever i went in villages i saw this uh, elephant shrine everywhere so again at this mound also this is this elephant shrine is here deepa what is the what is the significance of the elephant shrine uh, I, i mean it's my guess that uh, because this is this shrine is there is also uh, this shrine is also in uh, this uh, tilara kota this uh, palace city and according to shrenzang uh, uh, he mentions about the Uh, the room where mahamaya gave birth to uh, bodhisattva not birth but i mean the uh, room where uh, the, the uh, room of uh, mahamaya so shrenzang saw a shrine there so i have somehow uh, this is just a guess because i mean we know that uh, uh, in the con when this uh, uh, mahamaya got pregnant with uh, buddha so it was like you know elephant tears from the left side so Well, probably i mean i see some link between this uh, conception of uh, mahamaya and this shrine i i see some link because i mean at mahamaya this uh, samay mai temple at tilarakot also local people they come and they offer this elephant uh, thing this uh, elephant uh, uh, models like a small terracotta things and you will find it everywhere around this uh, uh, even in piprava i saw this and uh, at palta devi temple also i noticed this so it is everywhere in that area uh, around this lumbini and piprava and uh, tilara kota this area everywhere i noticed this wherever i went mm -hmm. so i see some connection between this but i mean coming back to this place like you know so this uh, mound this uh, this is called sagar mai here it's not called samai mai it's called sagar mai but again it's mai it's mother mai means mother so it's again related somewhere to the mother mm -hmm. uh deepa was just just for the listeners deepa was mentioning about piprawa that is the indian side of kapilavastu as you know there are two kapilavastu one is in the nepal and uh, tilarakot and another one is in india which is piprawa okay and they are actually not too far away they are actually close to each other as we know that kapilavastu itself was raised to the ground it was burnt to the ground because it was being attacked by king virudaka who took revenge uh on his uh, sakyan the uh, cousins all right so uh, so uh, deepak was saying that you have these elephant shrines even in kapilavastu uh, both on the uh, indian side as well as in the nepal side yeah so i mean this this uh, samai mai shrine in tilarakota when i mean when this indian archaeologist banerji when he discovered uh, when he discovered this site he found that uh, this uh, samai mai temple at tilarakota at that time also in 1899 so i mean that is i mean it's a very long tradition very ancient tradition which is still uh, like you know continuing there mm. so i would like to share like you know this is gentleman who who was my local host at valmiki nagar sri uh, pramod singh ji so i mean he he was a person who like you know he, he knows so much about this place so he took me to these two places and he told me that i mean these two mounts are there so i am thankful to him so yeah so this uh, this identification is also very important because uh, uh, this is uh, we know this is this is like you know bodhisattva siddhartha he left kapilavastu and uh, his uh, destination was uh, magadha empire so he took this route uh, he took this track from uh, he, he went through vaishali so we know that there, there are ashokan pillars at vaishali ariraj uh, lorya nandan gard so all this side this was an ancient trade route and uh, and this is an ashokan pillar here at lumbini and this was also track taken by mahaprajapati gotmi when he see one see went to vaishali for this like you know with 500 shakan women so this discovery which is here i mean so according to shrenzang this is the place where buddha cut his hair so this is a very good uh, i mean like you know so this identification uh, of course i mean it's a very preliminary stage but still i mean uh this will help us in completing this uh, mahabash uh, this great renunciation trail uh, which starts from kapilavastu ramagrama and anupia uh, uh, which was in malla kingdom 
And from here, then again, we have Ashokan pillar starts from here. So this would be a very like, you know, uh, a future for future. This could be a very great uh, pilgrimage trail walking or I mean something, anything. So this can be a very interesting uh, trail for pilgrimage and tourism. So again, uh, gratitude to Shrenzan. It is because of him that we know uh, we could discover, we could, uh, we could, I mean, like, you know, uh, look for it. Uh, go we, we could go searching for this place based on Shrenzan accounts only. So his contribution is so immense, so important. Uh, without him, we, we could have never known where all this thing happened. So this is basically, if anybody has any questions, uh, Uh, sir, hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, is that is that a question coming in? Yes. Yes, yes. Sir, the difference uh, between uh, Kapil Vastu and uh, Nova River is uh, mentioned as 30 yojan. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, in different texts, it's different things. Somewhere it's like a two yojan, in some texts, it's like, you know, 10 yojan. In some no, no, sir, sir. Sir, this is mentioned in Jatak Atkatha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that. I mean, you can read the book. I mentioned that. You can go to my blog and I have mentioned all this story. I mean, what says what, which literature says which. I mean, I've already put that there are three or four. All this literature which I've just mentioned, like, you know, yes, this, yeah, so all this literature, they have different versions. Like, you know, sir, if you, are, in, the, in, in this uh, book, sir, only mentioned Anumar Nadi Tire, but yeah. in the Tripitak, nowhere it is mentioned the place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Even all, at the time of cutting of the hairs, mothers and fathers were weeping. I mean, different literatures have mentioned. Sir, it is mentioned in the Arya Pariyashena Sutta of the Tipitak. Yeah. So how yeah. can you say that uh, uh, Buddha cut his hairs uh, at the river uh, Anuma, sir? I have mentioned, I have told you, you know, this, this is the description of the, all the details, what literature, uh, like, you know, this. Uh, Shrenzang says about uh, the place where he landed, where he sent back Chandaka from there uh, towards the east was the place where he cut his hair. So yes, sir, yes, sir. But that is only ancient book that is Jataka Katha, sir. But before Jataka Katha, it is not mentioned, sir. I mean, there are different biographical texts. I mean, I'm not disputing all those things. I'm just following the Shrenzang. I mean, okay, different, okay. Thank you, sir. different things. I'm, I'm not disputing that. But I mean, that is why I put all these versions, you know, what, uh, which literature says what, I've just put, I've collected all those things, information, I've just put it in, you know, this table. So you can, I mean, based on all this input, because all of them not are not covering the entire episode. I mean, all of them don't say everything. I mean, they are just skipping something, some details, they are putting something, uh, some other details. So I've just tried to collect all those things and put and uh, try to put and uh, try to weave a story around what Shrenzang has said. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so um, so uh, Deepak, you have actually done this journey, uh, yeah. seven hundred and fifty kilometers, which I think right now much more <laughs> that you have traveled. Can you please tell us, you know, how easy or how difficult is it to uh, to move around in order to uncover these places, you know, of following the Sunshine Trail, uh, because you are just wandering, just with a haversack, traveling very light, and uh, how is the journey? Especially now when there is this COVID-19, how do you manage to do all this? COVID was uh, not a big issue because you know in India still there's a tradition if there's somebody who's doing pilgrimage, so people in villages, even in cities, they are very welcoming. I, uh, during my whole pilgrimage, I always stayed in temples. So most of the time I stayed in temples. So, and everywhere, nobody discriminated anything, you know, because I was taking all the precautions. So, and they offered food and they even said they can stay for even more days. So, uh, I mean, I didn't see, face any, like, you know, I was uh, anticipating that because of COVID, I can, I would face some discrimination, but I didn't face any discrimination at any place. Uh, as far as difficulty is concerned, uh, I mean, it was not at all difficult because, I mean, if you, if you read Shrenzang accounts and as I was walking, I could imagine how difficult it would have been at that time because it, at that time there were no roads. It was all dense forest, especially if you see the Shrenzang thing, you know, from, uh, uh, if you see Shrenzang's, uh, Travel from uh, Sankisa to Shavasti. From Shavasti, everything was like you know in a very bad shape. When he reached Shavasti, there were very few people there, 
at uh, Kapilavastu, I mean, it was in very bad shape. He says there were more than 1,000 monasteries in ruins. There were nobody at Kapilavastu, I mean, for palace city. There was only small monastery. There, there were a handful of people who guided him to neighboring place. And it was such a desolate thing that, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, Shwenzang was at Tilarakota and Piprava is just here. Piprava was a very important place. This was the place where uh, Shakyan people, they deposit the body relics of the Buddha. Yet, uh, Shwenzang was not told about it. And, and archaeological evidence suggests in the second century AD, this monastery was abandoned. So, this place was totally abandoned and it went out of tradition. So, this place was such a wild and I mean, it was so engulfed by the forest that uh, all these important places were out of tradition. Nobody knew about this. The people who were at Tilarakota, Lumini, who guided Shrenzang and Fashin, they didn't mention about Piprava, though it was such an important place. It was a, uh, the Kapilavastu monastery. The, the central monastery of the Kapilavastu empire was here and it was situated around this uh, relic stupa, which was made by Ashoka. And I mean, before that, Shakin's people built that stupa. It is, it is established in excavation. We have found inscriptions also saying that this is uh, Kapilavastu Monastery. So yet, I mean, they could not. So the idea is that this whole trail was, I mean, at Ramagrama also, there was only few people who were taking care of the shrine. And again, I mean, Shrenzang and Fashian, both of them, they warned that, I mean, this is very, uh, this whole track is in the forest and it's very wild. You have to be very careful with, I mean, wild animals. They always, they mention all these things. And they have not mentioned this anywhere else. What they uh, all these uh, warnings which they say, uh, they mention, it's only from Shravasti to like, you know, Kushinagar. Even Kushinagar was totally abandoned. There was nobody. I mean, he doesn't talk about any monastic community there at uh, Kushinagar. So while I was walking, I was reminded about all those things. I knew that uh, this was one of the uh, difficult, most difficult trek both of these monks uh, who took. And we should be grateful to them. I mean, I'm sure they must be, they, were, they must have been warned somewhere that you should not go further this side because this is not a safe place. Yet because they were devout Buddhist. And Shrenzang had a very uh, a larger picture in his mind for Buddhist pilgrimage. I mean, he, he knew he has to go back and he has to promote Buddhism. So he didn't want to skip anything. So he risked his life and he traveled to all these places, which was like, you know, dense forest. So while I was uh, walking, I was not allowed to go to Nepal, but I mean, I still uh, walked along the border. So uh, I, uh, I noticed one thing that uh, wherever I stayed in the evening, people would share with me the stories of tiger and leopard. Like, you know, till very recently, tigers and leopards would enter in their villages and they would uh, take away goats and, uh, you know, uh, animals. So it was still very prevalent. So I mean, you can just imagine at the time of Shenzhen how dangerous this trek uh, would be like. You know, I mean, this is uh, for our our own imagination. So I was I was knowing all those things. So when I was staying uh, at the villages, I would share all the stories about Buddha and Shenzhen, and I told them that this is the oh, the most important trek. Like you know, because this was a trek which was taken by Buddha, and after that Mahapajapati got me also. So this this has a very immense future pilgrimage potential. Many people would love to walk and take this trail uh, following the footsteps of the Buddha and uh, Mahapajapati Gautami. So yes, I didn't face any, I mean, I, I, I was not at all concerned about the difficulties. I mean, in modern times, sir, I mean, there's a very good road and you have all modern gadgets. So you don't have to think about all those things. And Shrenzan is such a big inspiration. If you read his travel accounts, so you don't uh, see anywhere, you know, even difficulties the he sees, he just uh, mentioned it as it is. Now, he doesn't say it's like it is bad or good. He just says, I mean, a few people died. I mean, few of his people died while crossing this uh, mountain range. So, I mean, he doesn't say that, oh, it's very bad. Somebody died and this, this, he said, this many people died. I mean, it, he just sees things as it is, it's just happening. So he was very mindful and he was not judgmental. Like, you know, he was just, uh, he knew that all this thing happens when, when you are making travel. So this Gandak River itself is a very important river. Just looking at the map that you have, it looks yeah. at the, all the important cities, right? Uh, there is one map that you had, which shows, you know, the cities, the trade route along the Gandak River, right? All the way. So after the Buddha cut his hair, he yeah. has actually traveled along this, uh, where the Gandak River is traveling, because that is actually the trade route, yes. Um, going all the way to Magadha, uh, yeah. Because current day, uh, this is what we call Bihar. Bihar yeah. is actually a short form for Vihara, right? Yeah. So there were yeah. there were a lot of uh, religious practitioners. So after the Bodhisattva has uh, renounced, he had to go to the place 
where they are practitioners. And uh, yeah. you know, he went from teacher to teacher, and you know that he studied under two very famous teacher, Alara Kalama and uh, uh, Udaka Ramaputta. And after not being able to find enlightenment under the teachers, he decided to go on his own to Dungashiri, which is close to uh, Budgaya. And uh, then uh, we know that later on, six years of, of going doing uh, ascetic practices, he decided to adopt the middle path. And uh, he also crossed a river, the Naranjaya River, to the other side and sat under the Bodhi tree that we call that right now as, uh, you know, where the Mahabodhi uh, tree, Mahabodhi temple is actually, actually situated. So this is actually a very important river. It's called Ganda, River Ganda, right? Ganda River. So right. it is uh, all the trade routes, is, they're just falling along, along the, the river. So actually this map gives him a completely different understanding because if we go by road, we actually go to Nepal this way. But from this map, I could actually see they following the Ganda River. And it actually makes a, a lot of sense. Well, and, uh, the river is also for transportation, for water, things like that. And there are Ashokan pillars here, like, you know, to, to mark this route. I mean, they have, uh, yeah. there are Ashokan pillars here. At Vaishali, there's an Ashokan pillar. Mm. There's a Nandangar, Lumbini. And I mean, we know that this was the, I mean, like, you know, uh, Rama Grama, uh, Buddha came. And uh, from here, I mean, Nandangar also, Ashokan Stupa is here. So uh, Ashokan pillar is here. So this is, I mean, and this is following the Gandak river. I mean, this is moving yeah. along the Gandak river. Yes. And I've, initially, I had some apprehension because I was told that Gandak River at this place has got lots of crocodile. But when I went there and I inquired local people, they said there are crocodile. But still, I mean, it's the people are I mean traveling through this. I mean, so crocodile is not a big threat. Earlier, I thought that I mean maybe uh, Shenzang didn't cross uh, uh, here. I thought he must have gone from here somewhere here. This this he he, he could have taken that route. But uh, when I reached here, when I did some inquiry, he told no. I mean, this is the favorite place. I mean, this is a prevalent place where people used to cross Gandak since a uh, long time. So then I got confidence. Otherwise, I was also hoping that, I mean, I was also wanting to explore this uh, trail, you know, this track, because there are two Ashokan pillars here. Oh. But, uh, uh, now, I mean, when I went to this place and when I saw these two Ashokan, these this two big mounds in the middle of the forest, and there are no other mounds, and as Shenzang said, exactly they are placed like that. So, I mean, I there was no doubt. And now the bricks, and they are all stupa shaped. I mean, they are all round and I mean, like in a sphere, uh, sphere spherical shape. And as Shenzang says, one of them was a small stupa. He says, I mean, he, he uses this word small stupa. And another stupa is a shokan stupa. So, yes. So, it would be good if, you know, the Indian archaeology, uh, yeah. you know, would do some kind of uh, work here. Yeah, in order exactly. to you know ascertain that this is indeed a place, uh, just yeah. looking at the bricks that is being used, you know, uh, this this will have a uh, very uh, you know religious significance for the Buddhists, and this yeah. will completely open up the uh, the scope for Buddhist pilgrimage actually. Yeah. And we have we have also to locate this third stupa, the first stupa, which should be at the bank of. Um, I was just talking, you know, that first yeah. stupa should be somewhere here. It should be somewhere here, you know, it's a very big area. So next time when I go, because I could not finish this Nepal part, I was yeah. not allowed to enter Nepal. So when I go to Nepal part, I would try to, I would want, uh, like to explore this area because this area is Nepal, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, all three, I mean, like, you know, so this is a big area. It's like, you know, 10, 15 kilometers area. So, and there are many villages here. Uh -huh. So I hope to find somewhere here because it was east of this. So it should be somewhere, anywhere, anywhere in this area, you know. So this is also forest. So I could not do much exploration because I was not allowed to go and enter these places. But uh, east of this, these two mounds, I mean, as Shwenzang says, uh, it was found. So I, I, I'm sure I, uh, some exploration would lead us to find this first stupa also. Yes, once if you find the third, uh, the third stupa, then yeah. indeed, uh, the, you, know, you can almost like confirm that based on yeah. Sanchez's records that these are the places that Sanchez described. Uh, yeah. What was the villagers reaction when they found that these stupas are connected with the Buddha? Do they know very much about the Buddha? I told this story, but they were not, I mean, like, you know, very, uh, because many people, they do not, they are not aware about Buddha also, like, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, but when I shared this with uh, Pramod Singhji, when I, he was my host, when I shared with him, he was he knew about Buddha and also he was also surprised because uh, this was totally unexpected. But what uh, what I find interesting is these two mounds, there are like, you know, they say there are 52 gars. This is called Bhavan Gadi. Gar means anything which has got big structure. 
Gad means anything mound or I mean, like you know, anything which is made of bricks, ancient bricks. So this Bhavan Gadi, there are like you know they say there are 52 Gadis in this whole area. I mean this Valmiki Nagar area, which is worshipped by uh, this Tharu people. But they say this is the central, like this is the main. This two, uh -huh. and rest of the mounds they are like on the hilltop and somewhere. These are the only two mounds in this whole area. They say that there is no other mound. in the like you know from this area this area there is no other mound so this also further confirms and this is under continuous the, the people they are worshiping it i mean still this tribal people who are like you know the most ancient uh, settlers here they they are living here for past many centuries so this i see some ancient connection this uh, worshiping thing is coming down the line i mean when buddhist left so maybe when these people uh, arrived there so they found some connection so this worshiping part is like you know this uh, Uh, the sanctity is continued. Yeah. This is what I'm, I'm. Did you say that the people were Taru? Taru yeah, people. Taru. Uh, yeah, because there, there are also Taru people in uh, Nepal, and yeah, they are yeah. also Buddhists actually. Yeah. Some yeah. of them. These Tharus, they have come from Nepal. I mean, they have all come uh, from the. Hill area. Okay. Okay. All right. Now I just like to know, uh, Bobby. Uh, are there questions coming in? yeah so uh, i would like to request all the listeners please uh, let us uh, please join us in making shrenzang popular famous people should know that uh, immense contribution of shrenzang because generally we are being taught that shrenzang was a uh, uh, visitor who came to india he was not an ordinary person he was an extraordinary person his contribution is so immense in understanding the buddhist pilgrimage and this whole work of this uh, retracing bodhisattva shrenzang is to create awareness about uh, the works of shrenzang his contribution so please join us in this effort of uh, making shrenzang a like you know real i mean his we should be we should acknowledge his contribution in proper way and this is our uh, website if somebody if he wants to contribute i mean he can he can visit our this site and uh, please help us join us yes um maybe while the others are thinking about uh, the questions to ask yeah, yeah. i think they are probably like overwhelmed by the presentation uh what was it that actually set you on this path of trying to discover the trails a uh, swanchang trail what was it that actually inspired you why do you want to uh, uh, move on this way i've been working on shrenzang for like you know past 12 years now when i was in uh... nalanda i got in contact with nam nalanda mahavir dr pant so he really inspired me to read shrenzang text i was an engineer so it was all new to me so when i read shrenzang book i found it a very i mean like you know jigsaw puzzle so i i found it very interesting to like you know uh, get engaged into it and to see objectively how because then i also came to know that many places have not been identified and there are multiple identification of many places so i just wanted to explore and just uncover this whole puzzle so when i read this book i read this book multiple times and based on because i had an engineering so I, what i did was uh, based on book i created excel files and objectively you know uh, put the whole book on excel sheets and then i prepared map so at that time i was doing everything in fun but then i realized that this is a very interesting task because uh, we have all the modern because britishers had this difficulty they didn't had maps they didn't had this google earth they didn't had all the gis uh, tools so then i somehow i learned the, this is another gentleman sanjay mathur ji so he got he gave me all the gis uh, software and everything he taught me how to study maps and everything so based on that then i started plotting and then i it became very interesting as i started going to places because wherever you i mean shrenzang says and if you go to that place you will find those things i mean this is so interesting villages settled on the mounds caves rock shelters at shrenzang described so after a point i thought that why not uh, because then If you go to places, if you go to Shravasti, like you know, if, so only Jetavana is the place which where people go. But Jetavana is surrounded by many other smaller shrines, which Shrenzang says. Then those shrines, many of those shrines are protected monument by ASI, but nobody goes there. So people, people should know that this, the pilgrimage that we are currently taking is a very small pilgrimage. Shrenzang talks about a very elaborate pilgrimage. So the pilgrimage that we are doing currently is. Uh, a small pilgrimage which was revived by britishers i mean it was 150 years ago 100 years ago so now we should think about uh, reviving the complete pilgrimage mentioned by shrenzang i mean we can do it i mean it's not a difficult task now 
did such face such a big difficulty in spite of you know the story of nalanda uh, they were so inspired by shrenzang accounts that uh, in 1914 when first world war was going on still the money came from asiatic society of uh, great britain to start excavation of nalanda so they were very passionate people and they did all those what the present pilgrimage is totally done by most of the work is done by britishers i mean british explorers at that time archaeological survey of india of that times so now we have sufficient uh, resources and manpower and people like you know now i mean malaysia is also here and japan korea everybody like you know singapore taiwan thailand burma so all of us can come together and revive the whole pilgrimage because they are not although buddha walked in whole gangetic plain but then shrenzang talks about only 22 20 30 places where buddha walked so instead of 8 we should go to 30 there are only 30 places they are not millions only 30 places which we have to like you know bring to the pilgrimage uh, thing so uh, this was one idea to create awareness second thing was like you know all these ancient things are in the villages and like you know if you go to purvarama which is in uh, uh, shravasti there is a village khandavari settled on the this mound so there is a monk who is uh, trying to create awareness and i i spent time with this villages so all the elder people they are totally ignorant about the significance of the place but i mean the the young generation there was a girl called priyanka i mean all of this new generation are interested now so we have to tap all this potential and we have to use we have to come together and revive the complete pilgrimage of shrenzang this is why i am thinking of making a good documentary film in like you know in all languages so that if people start going to these places these people will these places will be revived these local people will start valuing their heritage this interaction is also important so one objective of this walk was this uh, shrenzang retracing bodhi sattva shrenzang is to create awareness among the local people so that is why i am writing all the blogs what i am uh, what local people think how to i mean what is there so local people are not uh, i mean th- 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 when they listen to all the stories they are little, uh, equally overwhelmed and then they feel that oh i mean uh, such a great place it is so this is the idea like you know to take this pilgrimage from eight great places to Elaborate with this pilgrimage. What Shrenzang says, even if you go to Kapilavastu, Tilarakota, there are many small, little known places around there. But I mean, people are not interested. People generally because they are not aware. Similarly, if you go to Sarnath, there is a site called Lat Bhairav, which Shrenzang talks about Ashokan Pillar. So the site is very much there, and it's very close to uh, this uh, Rishi Patana site, the main Ashokan Pillar site. So uh, even in Bodh Gaya. people just limit themselves to the mahabodhi temple they don't go to brahmayuni many people they don't go to sujata place the place where buddha took austerity so the idea is to create awareness about the elaborate buddhist pilgrimage which shrenzang talks about okay now i think there are uh, some things that uh, that uh, deepak has mentioned just for the sake of our audience who have not uh, gone over to india one was uh, uh, deepak was mentioning about pubarama right uh, deepak yeah uh, yeah the, Kupa Rama was a gift by uh, of uh, Pusaka, yeah. uh, because she was a major sponsor, a lay major sponsor of the Buddha. And uh, you see, once the Buddha reached about the age of of fifty five, he wanted to have an ideal place where the in order to spend the rainy seasons. And you know that in India there are actually three seasons. One of the seasons is the rainy season. Now he was actually invited over to. Uh, Uh, to uh, the Shravasti by Anatta Pindika, and the Buddha spent twenty-four rainy seasons, you know, a retreat twenty-four rich years, twenty-four years at uh, the uh, Shravasti. But out of that, nineteen was spent in uh, Jetavana Grove, and about five was in Pubarama, oh, yeah. which was also in the uh, in the Shravasti, but being offered by Vishaka. So the so uh, what Deepak was saying is now this Pubarama. There is a village on top of it because people didn't know the the significance of it. Of course, when we go for pilgrimage, we go over to Jetavana Grove. It is still there, but we didn't know that there is another place where the monks and the Buddhas spend five rain, rainy seasons there, and that's called Pubarama. All right. So this is how the concept of our pilgrimage could actually be opened up when we discover new things. And there is another thing. Uh, if you could go back to your picture of the Ramagram. Yeah, no. This is called a Rama Grama. In fact, during my first two pilgrimages, I did a pilgrimage when I was about the age of twenty-five, a backpacker with with uh, four other friends, and we followed some kind of itinerary. But we never came to this place. 
And another time we went, I went for pilgrimage in 1992 and we didn't, we were not brought to Ramagrama, but actually this Ramagrama is really significant. This Ramagrama stupa is in the land of the Koliyas and the Koliyas is from the Buddha's mother's side. Okay. Mahamaya uh, and uh, Prajapati Gotami. They are the Koliyas. And you see after the Buddha passed away, where after the body was cremated, the remains of the Buddha was actually uh, put into eight portions. And one portion, one eighth of the portion was given to the Koliyas. And then they, 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 they built this stupa called Rama Grama. Okay, so these stupa enshrined one eighth of the Buddha's remains. Now, I'm, when Ampura Ashoka became a Buddhist at about 200, 200 years, 250 years after the Buddha, after he was converted into, into Buddhism, he decided to build stupas all over his kingdom. And in order to get relics, he had to get the relics from seven of the stupas. So he opened up the stupas, took out the relics, leave a little bit behind and use the relics in order to uh, implant these relics in all the stupas that he has built. But when he came over to this Ramagrama stupa, because the land of the Koliyas was not under Ashoka's, uh, uh, it was not under, under his territory, you know, it's not under his empire. The people here, um, uh, you can call them Nagas, they say that please, uh, Emperor, please do not uh, remove any of the relics here. And uh, so it is actually believed that one eighth of the relics are still intact in this stupa. Yeah. In fact, according to Xuanzang, that, that sometimes light would emanate from the stupa at night, and even elephants will come and sprinkle water over the stupa. So if you no. come over for a pilgrimage, the next time when you go to Lumpini, please come and visit Ramagrama and do some meditation down there. Now Ramagrama becomes more well-known. In fact, this whole place has been, has been done up very nicely. And this is what Deepak is saying. When right. people begin to discover about the place, then they begin to look after it, and the local people begin to have a sense of appreciation for, you know, for that they have a heritage place. And this is called the Rama Grama Stupa. Yeah, and the, I mean, Shrenzan talks about a very interesting story that cobra snakes, they take care of it, like, you know, it protects it. Yes. The cobra snakes, I mean, all those stories. But I mean, Shrenzan talks about this place that uh, it is being taken care by cobra snakes, Naga. Yes, cobras and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, at that time, it was quite quite dangerous to remove anything from here, and it remains there. There is one question, uh, uh, Deepak, and yeah. this comes from the World Fellowship of Buddhist Youth uh, Facebook page. Uh, this is from uh, Brahmanda Pratap Barua Ripon. The question, why don't you make a pilgrimage brochure where people can find all the information? Yeah, I mean, uh, we are in the process of that. That's what the, uh, I was talking to you, Dr. V, yesterday. I mean, we should come out with, I mean, like, you know, as you mentioned that you would be talking to IBC and all uh, your friends and all. So we can come together. We can make a very comprehensive uh, documentary film and brochures and uh, publications and website mm -hmm. so that people can see all the maps and all the places, significance. How do we know those places are correct places? And I mean, all the story, because one of the objectives of this walk is also to tell the story behind the things, you know, how do we know that these places are correct places? Mm. Because there are, all the places have got multiple identifications. Yes. So, and many of these identifications are multiple and people are still continuing with it because uh, the names of Britishers are involved with that. So they don't want to challenge it. Yes. But they don't understand that these places were identified 150 years ago when there were no proper maps. And most of the times, these explorers, they didn't themselves go there. I mean, they just collected information from there. I mean, like, you know, subordinates who would go uh, to, like, you know, if you see this map. So this is, you know, this is the Cunningham route. I mean, so wherever he went, he found some mound. He said, this is this. So Shenzang says, next, this. So when he goes, he finds some another village with some mounds. He said, this is this. So, I mean, this is, this is the trail like this. Wherever he went, he found. And there are some stories like, you know, he went to some village. This Carlyle went to one village. And he said, this, this village is Kapilavastu and this water tank, it is called something related with elephant. So later on, some explorer went to just recheck what Kailal has said. So when they went to that village and they inquired the local people, where is this particular uh, water tank which Kailal has mentioned with the name of elephant? He said, this is not called the elephant tank. Uh, Kailal came and he himself named this tank as elephant tank. Huh. You know? So, I mean, this is, if you read this text, it's all there. So this all this identification are 
totally under we should re examine all this text i mean so uh, the idea is when we come out with this text this book so we should also talk about why this identification is correct why this identification is wrong because at many places we have not found any inscription like veluvana no inscription has been found and vulture speak no inscription has been found but we are sure that these are the places because circumstantial evidence are so strong like jethi and yastivana no inscription has been found prag bodhi hill no inscription has been found if you go to uh, even sankasya no inscription has been found no excavation has happened there yet so but the circumstantial evidence are so strong everything is like you know so compelling so we on the basis of that we said that this are the correct identification but this identification like you know if we didn't find all these ashokan pillars here so we would have still continued with all this identification made by cunningham and carlyle but we are fortunate that 25 years after this identification in the jungle i mean it was very difficult to find this uh, there are so many stories interesting stories how these three pillars were discovered so if we for some reason if we could not uh, discover this we were not able to discover this ashokan pillars so we would have continued still with all these things all these places we would have continued so we are fortunate that we found this so that's why we know that this rama grama is wrong and rama grama here is correct so the chandaka stupa which was identified by carlyle and cunningham here it is not here it should be somewhere here so we should come out that is why i have shared this story of why to we say that this is the correct place and i mean the, another thing is when shwenzang says so there is very little question of like you know doubt i mean when i went to this place even before that uh when i plotted this i was expecting that i should find this stupa somewhere here i mean this is just a, i was i prepared all these maps one year two years before this walk you know i was working on this i will take the walk this someday so i should look for here and there and you go there and you found there find that it's a, such a, it's not a coins i mean it's this great i mean coincidence that shwenzang says and it's a, you and they are all ancient mounds the bricks are very ancient yeah, and I, it, think, i think that's very interesting i think what i learned uh, Deepak, is that sometimes when we hear the name of Cunningham, it's almost like wow, you know, these are these these are the you know the famous archaeologists. Only to find out that even archaeologists sometimes can actually make a mistake, and once oh. they go onto the mistake, they try to get evidence when there is no real evidence. Yeah. And as part of the scientific uh, discipline, we if there is a better you know evidence, we will have to discard. the what we have and to shift on shift track and exactly. it is a good thing that uh, that the ashoka pillars was actually discovered and enables us to shift track and because of that now you can find the two months now there are some questions that have just come in uh, deepak uh, let me see uh, okay now there is uh, three questions here one is by victoria go and he says uh, mr deepak in the long discourse 27 the buddha delivered an important sutra at the megara mother mentioned in shabati uh, the indian archaeological society as i un understand was unable to identify the mention whether you managed to identify the migara mother mention that is number one eh? the mother migara mother mention in shabati and i wish indian archaeological society says they could not they cannot find it whether you can number two we have uh, from uh, uh, do you want me to go to the three questions or one by one yeah this question i mean this first question okay. uh, the link uh, the, the, this place is purva rama this this event took place in purva rama so this place has been i mean we do not this village which we are talking about it is settled on that mound right. so the place is actually called uh, purva rama the, the, purva this rama. yeah so i mean i had mentioned about this in my story on purva rama you can find on that my blog so right. we can say, we can send him the link of that story because i was purva rama i have mentioned all those things that he has mentioned it's there okay So, yeah. so this uh, Megara mother's mansion is actually Pubarama. Pubarama, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Megara's mother, because sometimes the mother's name is yeah. being called by the Ch Charles name, <laughs> yeah. uh, the son, the, the mother of the mother of so and so. Okay, yeah. so that is actually Pubarama, uh, um, which uh, Deepak mentioned. Okay, so actually, uh, if you go to uh, the Shravasti. Uh, 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 yeah shravasti this is where pubarama is there but we are not giving a lot of significance to that there's another one from bikram uh, pandek and uh, he says deepak g the red bullet you have shown in the map above the name uh, chandaka kantaka appears to be in the nepal indian border 
Gandaki River Junction known as Tree Benne. What do you think, Deepak Ji? Uh, sir, I cannot say anything on this unless until I do some exploration here because it's, uh, I told you, uh, it should be somewhere here. I mean, it should be somewhere here. Uh, because this is all forest and at that time it was even dense forest. And this is the only small open uh, window which opens here. Otherwise, here also further south, there's a hill. I mean, there's a small like, you know, um, hillock, which is uh, like, you know, not uh, uh, good for uh, transportation, I mean, for travel. So this is the only small window. So my hope is, my guess is that it should be somewhere in this area, the Chandaka Stupa. Triveni is further up. I mean, it's like, you know, further on the hills. So I don't think it is on the hill because the horse landed on the sand. I mean, it says, Pali literature says it landed on the sand. So it is on the sand. So sand is only here. I mean, this is the place where, this is the area where there was sand and river was flowing here. Like, you know, it was going from here. So it can be anywhere here. I mean, it will take another one or two months when this lockdown is over and I go there, I can, we can explore and we can see where it is. Mm, okay. And there is a question from Victor Go again. Mr. Deepak, as I understand, there is a scandal with regards to the site of Kapilavastu in India. Uh, this is in regards to Dr. Furious identification of Indian Kapilavastu, because in the view of Dr. Charles Allen's research and UNESCO's research, what is your take of Mr. Charles Allen's finding that the Indian Kapilavastu is not the hometown of the Buddha? Let me let me explain. I mean, Kapilavastu was an empire. It was a kingdom. It was not a. It was a capital. It was an empire, and there was a capital. So the Indian Kapilavastu Piprava is not a, according to me, what I think it is not a city. It is not a capital city. It was the monastery of Kapilavastu. The inscription says it is the monastery of Kapilavastu. And Shakyan people, because it was part of the Kapilavastu empire, so the palace city is Tilarakuta. That is correct. I mean, what Charles Allen say, I totally agree with him. I've also put a story on my blog on this, that Kapilavastu, the present identification, Tilarakuta, I think it is the correct identification. It is the palace city. And the Piprava is also Kapilavastu, but it is part of the Kapilavastu empire. It is not Kapilavastu city. City is Tilarakota, but this is the Piprava was the monastery of Shakyan people, the important monastery, the central monastery, which they funded. And this is where they enshrined the relics. So I have put a story on this. I mean, there are two or three stories which I mentioned. I, I have also spoken about we should connect these two places, Piprava and Tilarakota, because if people from royal people, they came and they enshrined the relics at Piprava. So there must be some connection. This Piprava should be an important place at that time. That's why they choose that place to enshrine the Buddha relics there. That is why they choose to establish a monastery there, Kapilavastu monastery. So we should connect these two places and there should be no dispute of like, you know, Indian Kapilavastu and Nepalese Kapilavastu. Kapilavastu was empire. Yeah. Supposedly, I mean, like, you know, if there's some country and they divide into two parts, like South Korea, North Korea, but it is Korea. It's just like, you know, so this, uh, at that time, it was not like, you know, India or Nepal. So it was a Kapilavastu empire. So it, now this present border has just divided this two, uh, Kapilavastu into two halves. Yes, I think sometimes there can be a misunderstanding. Actually, yeah. because of the border, uh, you know, the entry point, after Tilara Court, in order to get to Piprawa, you've got to go a long way, pass through the, uh, the DCIQ, the customs, immigration and all that, and travel along this road uh, to Piprawa. It makes you think that the Tirala Court and Piprawa are really far away, but actually it is not. It is if the border is actually open, you can actually just cross over. You must remember that the uh, city of Kapilavastu was actually raised to the ground. It was burned to the ground and the Sakins were killed, right? Yeah. And that was during the time when the Buddha was alive. So the whole Kapilavastu as a walled city surrounded by moat and all that was completely burnt to the ground. And the Buddha's relics, after the city had been burnt to the ground, the Buddha's relics was put at, uh, at uh, Piprawa, which is also part of, of part of the kingdom, right? So, uh, and that, that is at the monastery, that is on the Indian side. So actually, there should not have been really a big problem, uh, unless you say that Piprawa is where the prince grew up, and uh, then that could be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. V, so this is the Tilara Kota and mm -hmm. this is Pitrava. So yes. you can see, uh, like, you know, so this is just like, you know, just 17 kilometers from here. Yeah. Lumbini, this is the Indian Nepal border. So I walked along this border and uh, Shrenzang says there were thousand monasteries of Kapilavastu which were like in uh, ruins. I encountered many remains, uh, ancient remains along this trail, you know, 
mounds which anybody could guess that they are like you know some ancient remains so this area has got lots of ancient remains this indian side so they were all like you know monasteries which uh, shrenzan says like thousands he says thousands of more than 1000 monasteries of kapilavastu they are in ruins they are in bad shape so all these monasteries they are on both sides so i saw many monastic remains i mean uh, they were remains i i don't claim they were monastic remains but they could be monastic remains because they were all ancient remains i, I walked along this trail from coming from uh, shravasti so uh, so this is kapilavastu was on the both side it's, it's on the both side yeah yeah <laughs> this is the kingdom of the sakyas but yeah, this is divided into nepal and india but this was on kingdom yeah. there's a question deepak by uh, mary aubrey and she says uh, deepak will you point out on the map with kapilavastu and vishali where the mounds you find are so that he, she can get a bearings uh, uh, based on where you have been so this is the place where the two mounds have been discovered this is this a place mm. so this is ramagrama so uh, uh, this is the place i think the where according to shrenzang uh, Uh, Shrenzang took this route. He crossed. Uh, he traveled from Ramagrama to hair cutting stupa. He traveled east. Yes. So this is east. This is the best possible place which I I could guess. Yes. And uh, I found these two stupas here. So this is the ancient Anupia because I mean this was this happened in Anupia according to other literatures. Mm, Anupia. Anupia. Yeah, Anupia is part of Ma Malas. Mm. So for the again, Malas. Oh yeah, Malas. They were yeah. also supporters of the Buddha, the Malas. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. from here shrenzang goes fashion and shrenzang goes to the stupa where charcoal stupa was there you know where this moriyas of people even so i travel further this side and i have located that village also but i am not very sure about it so i'm not talking about that village in this uh, talk so that village somewhere here i have already put that story on the blog so from here shrenzang come to came to here and so this is the route which was this was the ancient route i mean this was the ancient route which i i think this was the ancient route taken by bodhisattva siddhartha and after uh him mahapajapati gotmi also took the same route following mm. that mm. yeah. and of course veshali at that time was a very important trade route trading yeah. route city of veshali yeah and this ashokan stupa they are to mark some important journey mm. in mark the footsteps of the buddha they are all dhamma pillars yes. so they are all falling in the line i mean you can see this is the curve yes rama yeah. grama is here so i mean we have to just connect this two dot rama grama and nandangarh we have to connect this two dot mm. this falls exactly in the between hmm. so uh, we know from other literature that bodhisattva siddhartha crossed ramagrama hmm. and this is ashokan pillar so this is our best possible guess that this was the ancient trade route so yeah. if we connect this two dot it goes through this so this is the anupia i mean it is also corroborated from that ways also okay so there is a feedback from bikram uh, pandey and he says that uh, thank you deepak ji Uh, I'm happy with your explanation because that he was the first uh, first one who asked a question, and uh, there is a question from Char Wilkins. He says, "Do I remember correctly that you told us that the smaller bricks meant that they are older than the larger bricks?" I uh, no no I didn't say that. I mean I myself confused because I I take always advice of my friends who are archaeologists who are into excavations. So when I found, I mean, when I discovered this stupa, I was overwhelmed because this, this, because I was expecting this, and when these people took me there, I was overwhelmed because exactly this is what Shrenzang says. So it took me a while to get into back into my like you know senses. I mean, I was like you know totally dumbstruck. I was totally dumbfounded. Like you know, I was totally numb. What happened? I mean, this is what Shrenzang says that it is here. So after that, I measured those bricks. sizes and then i whatsapp dept to my friend and then they immediately uh, responded that this uh, this could be anything from shunga period to kushana period mm. so i don't have any say i don't i'm not an archaeologist so i don't have any say on what this bricks are but my friends they say that uh, and my friend uh, sujit nain is a very good archaeologist so he says that so i mean he is a very experienced archaeologist so he says that so and this mound is very big i told you know when i saw this uh, mound i was like you know totally dumb found it i didn't know how to react because uh, i was not uh, i mean i so easily i mean i could <laughs> trace it i was not expecting it to happen like you know so easily mm. so uh, so i'm i'm not i'm not claiming that small bricks are from ancient and brick bricks are this this i don't know anything all of all those things yeah. whenever i find any such thing i just <laughs> send this to my friends in archaeology who are who are archaeologists 
So two or three friends, they all of them they confirmed that this is from Shungen Kushan period. And I mean, these are on the surface. If you further dig, I mean, this is not the end of the. I mean, this this is not the last word. I mean, it is there. Anybody can go and do further excavation, exploration, and they can find many more many more things there. Because I was there hardly for half day. I didn't explore everything. I didn't measure everything. I because it was raining and it was all water everywhere, and it was all forest. So I mean, I didn't do very proper excavation. I mean, not proper exploration. Uh, so I mean, if somebody goes, then he can find something more also. We call it a recce, you know. <laughs> you just yeah. go there to check out to check out the place. <laughs> Now uh, there is a question, uh, Deepak. This is from uh, Rahul Gedam. He says, Deepak, oh, when was the last excavation that was done in any Buddhist sites in India? Excavation is going on every time. I mean, like you know, still I mean, some excavations are going at many places. Buddhist sites are like you know, uh, excavation is I mean happening every year. I mean, at some site, at some Buddhist sites. Okay. Now we have a question from R Ricardo Sasaki, all the way from Latin America. <laughs> uh, as someone who has been following the pilgrimages and efforts of Deepak Ji for many years, I want to congratulate the immense love and dedication that you show. This is a legacy for many generations of Buddhists. Ah, there's a, a, a lovely comment from from you, Ricardo. Um, <laughs> Ricardo is old friend. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a question from uh, Shantum Seth, who is actually going to be a speaker on this coming Sunday, and I'll say something about that at the end of this talk. Uh, his question is that you say that Fast Chen also visited Tilara Court besides Suanzang. Didn't the Fast Chen visit Piprawa and not Tilara Court? No, no, no. I mean, if they visited Piprawa, they should have mentioned about the relic stupa. Nobody, none of them have mentioned about the relic stupa. No, none of them. So I mean, this is a whole confusion. And Fashian is not. A, I mean, I have put a story on this. I mean, I can. It's a very big explanation why. Uh, I mean, this uh, few Indian archaeologists they have used Fashian, but they have used very in a very limited way. I mean, if you see the complete Fashian story, so Fashian is wrong. I mean, so I mean, this is a, there's a story on the blog. I mean, it's a very big explanation. It's not. Uh, Uh, we cannot finish it in 10 or 15 minutes there's a story on my blog i can uh, santam sir is one of my patrons of this walk he's one of the contributors so thanks to him so sir uh, I, i will share with him i will share with the, the story about uh, which i have put on the blog about this uh, why fashian is being misinterpreted i mean like you know he's uh, he's being bad uh, wrongly interpreted as uh, that he visited piprava no he didn't visit piprava because if he visited piprava he would have mentioned about the relic stupa the central point of piprava is the relic stupa buddha relics were there how can this both this ardent buddhist followers they can be silent about the relics of the buddha it's impossible <laughs> so uh, i don't think that uh, I, i don't think means i'm sure about it i mean it's uh, if you see that travel of uh, fashian it it uh, at some point he is wrong like you know his distance has been misinterpreted i put this story on my blog i mean and so you can visit that story mm okay so all right we almost come to the end of the talk and i think we uh, i would like on behalf of the buddhist jam fellowship to express our thanks and appreciation to uh to deepak for giving us such an interesting talk and this is a uh, this is a discovery that is that is opening many doors it is really pop breaking because uh, you know it is like opening uh, some new avenues for us uh, for people who are really keen on on pilgrimages all right so thank you so much at the park and we hope to hear from you again maybe it, uh, to tell us about more of your uh, you know uh, future discovery